Right, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to Wednesday. Welcome to May the 8th, and good to join you on this fine day to look into the scriptures. Hope that you're doing well. Hope uh, that you've had a wonderful week. It's Wednesday, as I said. It's the middle of the week, and uh, we're looking at uh, the middle of the work week, kind of sliding into the weekend here, uh, and trust that you've had a great week so far. We've had a wonderful time in church uh, this week as we've had our Faith, Family, and Culture Conference. It has been such a blessing uh, to study the Word of God, to hear the Word of God preach. It's been so encouraging, but, you know, also very convicting. Uh, and that's and that's a good thing. Conviction is a good thing. Uh, when you are not convicted, and I'll just kind of throw this in for free, when there is no conviction happening in your life, there's something wrong. Uh, there ought to be some convicting of the Holy Spirit. And if there's not, that means there's a, there's a problem, there's some sin, uh, there's some complacency in your life. And so conviction's a good thing when it comes to uh, the scriptures, the Holy Spirit's leading. Man, you, you should desire some conviction. And so, uh, and then also, let's do this. So it's been encouraging, it's been convicting, but there needs to be some change uh, as well as a result of the conviction. Uh, and conviction without change or repentance, we could say, what's, what's the point of that? Uh, and so there needs to be some repentance after that conviction. There needs to be some change after that conviction. That's why uh, there is an altar call at the end of services so that there can be some the beginning of change. There's some, all right, I've been convicted. Uh, uh, now let's go talk with the Lord and then let's, let's see some change. And so we've had a lot of that this week and it has been a blessing to be a part of. And, and my prayer for the week is that we would be changed uh, that we would be convicted and changed, and that, man, we would uh, draw closer to uh, the Lord. Uh, and and I, think, I think that's happened and will continue to happen even tonight. If you can, be in church this evening at 6 o'clock. All right, Daniel chapter 7. Let's look at verse number 15 as we continue to walk through, through this book here. Daniel's had a dream or a vision, we could say. Uh, and uh, we've read about that in these first couple verses, first 14 verses. We've made some comments as well. We've noted the four uh, different kingdoms that are represented here. Uh, we note the Babylonian kingdom. There is the, excuse me, the <clears throat> uh, Medo-Persian kingdom uh, that, that is represented as well. Uh, and then also we've got the Grecian kingdom. Uh, and then the Roman kingdom, these four kingdoms uh, of now our past, uh, Daniel, uh, it was the future for him and, and the present and into the future, uh, whereas he has this vision and this dream. And so now we're going to look at, and we also noted the Antichrist rising up, uh, and we'll note that a little bit more here. And the interpretation thereof. Not sure if we'll finish all of this. We'll see what we got. There's a lot of uh, reading here, but maybe we can get her, get her done today. Let's look at verse number 15. Daniel 7, verse number 15. Here we go. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit, in the midst of my, my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. And so, uh, wanting some clarity. What does this vision mean? What does this dream mean? Remember, Daniel had interpreted dreams and things before, uh, and now he's having a dream or a vision himself and he's troubled all right now what does this mean the the beauty is this is that he knows the god who's given this dream here he says i came near to one of them that stood by and asked him the truth of all of this so he told me and made me know the interpretation of the things and here's the interpretation of it, it says these great four beasts which are four are four kings which shall arise out of the earth but the saints of the most high shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. And so we have, first of all, this very broad uh, interpretation, okay? It says you had the four beasts in verse 17. Verse 18, the saints of the Most High uh, shall take the kingdom, possess the kingdom forever, speaking of the millennial reign, and so on. Uh, so we have this broad overview. And then verse number 19, uh, we, we see now getting a little bit more descriptive here. Then I would know... The truth of the four beasts, okay? Uh, who and what are the four beasts? Which was diverse from all the others, exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron and, and his nails of brass, which devoured, break in pieces and stamped the residue uh, with his, <coughs> excuse me, 
uh, with his feet. And, and, and we see here the truth of the four beasts, uh, which uh, we know to add reference that being the probably the Roman Empire. And of the ten horns that were in his head, and of the other which came up, and before whom three fell, even of that horn that had eyes and a mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. I beheld, and the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. Until the Ancient of Days came, and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High, and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. Uh, and thus he said, so now we see uh, he, he's given this, this fourth beast and leading up the ten horns ahead, uh, and so on. And then we see verse number 23. Then he said, once again, now the fourth, fourth beast, the fourth beast, which we read about in verse number 19, uh, which we noted back earlier up in the chapter, verse number 7, we see this description again of the fourth beast in chapter, verse number 7, dreadful, terrible, strong, exceedingly, and so on, uh, and great iron teeth, and so on. And, and then we note verse number 19, that further description of the fourth beast. We're now in verse number 23. We see this fourth beast again. And so getting further clarification, it says the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall be diverse from all nations. It shall devour the whole earth and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. Okay. Uh, and that, that we know the Roman Empire ruling for over a thousand years uh, and it, it doing that breaking uh uh, conquering everything, breaking it down to pieces, and ruling with that iron fist, okay? And then it says in verse number 24, And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise. So ten political figureheads that, that shall arise, and another shall arise after them. He shall be, be diverse, from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. And so this, this uh, what we know as Antichrist, and also being described in Revelation chapter number 13, uh, we know this Antichrist shall come to power. Uh, he, he will have what, a, what appears to be probably some sort of alliance with some of these kings that rise up, these ten horns out of this kingdom. And there's been some speculation. We'll just kind of throw this out there. We see a lot of alliances uh, in our world today, uh, a lot of different ways in which people are connected, whether it be geographically, politically, uh, maybe even militarily connected. There has been people have thrown out, I mean, since, uh, let's just say in, in recent times, people have thrown out these uh, these organizations that may lead to eventually lead to maybe these ten horns uh, I'm not saying these are it but uh, when we started seeing things like the United Nations being formed you know we've seen this joining together of country groups I know that there's a lot more countries involved in that than ten but that's just being an example uh, the European Union uh, we've got countries that have joined in together uh, in, in the European Union uh, and could could that eventually lead to uh, these ten hordes, these ten kingdoms uh, joining together out of one, and, and out of that one being the Antichrist rising up? Potentially, we've uh, we've uh, noted here even in recent years how that some countries are desiring to leave these organizations. Uh, I think of uh, uh, Great Britain that has left the European Union. Uh, we we see these. Um, Middle Eastern countries uh, uh, allying themselves as well, and we note that the common uh, the common enemy to these Middle Eastern countries being uh, uh, Israel, uh, being the common enemy. Uh, here's a here's just a thought too. Uh, we we see over on the other side of the world, and saw it in recent months, or maybe in the last year or two. Uh, some countries becoming buddy buddy that uh, wow uh, the Bible talks about these geographic areas and joining together and uh, uh, leadership in these geographic areas joining together. But I think of Russia, I think of China, 
I think of some of those countries that are kind of swallowed up uh, in, in the in the vastness of each one of those, and it may be that out of those 10 countries, uh, and as they add uh, other countries in, maybe I don't, I don't know what the uh, commonality is going to be. I don't know what the countries will be, but we do know this. There are 10 that come together. There's one that rises out. This Antichrist rises out uh, uh, above each one and begins to rule. Look at verse number uh, 25. We see that he subdues three kings in verse number 24. In verse number 25, and he shall speak great words against the Most High. We know that the Antichrist is Antichrist. He's anti-God. Uh, we know that some of the things that he does goes directly contrary to the Lord. Uh, he, said, goes, he speaks words against the Most High and shall swear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. Uh, and so uh, we note here this, this Antichrist is anti-God. Uh, he's anti-Christian. We note that the Antichrist comes to power during the seven years of tribulation, uh, comes to power and uh, begins to, to rule there and declares war against God, declares war against Christianity, seeks to destroy and eradicate Christianity. And even during the rapture, although... Uh, begin. I'm sorry. Uh, even during the tribulation, Christians will be persecuted. The tribulation follows the rapture, so all believers will be raptured up out. But but the Bible uh, tells us that there will be people that will be saved during the tribulation, uh, and uh, the Antichrist is anti God and will seek to destroy uh, those Christians during the tribulation. We see here that he changes times uh, and laws. Uh, and just to kind of throw this out there, uh, in the last several years through the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, and I don't know what you believe about that and what you think about that and, and so on. I'm not here to debate that right now. But during that pandemic, it was amazing to me how quickly people gave their rights up uh, in the name of uh security safety and so on uh, and so we gave our rights up uh, and it's even being talked about now that if there were to become if there if a pandemic were to come again uh, here in America is being talked about that America would submit to and give our sovereignty to the World Health Organization uh, and uh, all in the name of safety all in the name of security from a pandemic, we would give our rights, we would give our sovereignty over to a World Health Organization. Now, times and laws. Uh, the Antichrist would change some of these. Uh, it, if America gives her sovereignty to somebody else, times and laws will change. Even in our country today, there are some communities that are calling for some Islamic communities that are calling for Sharia law to be the law of that community rather than the laws of the United States of America being that law. They're calling for Sharia law, uh, which is, uh, is Islamic law and uh, very extreme for sure. Okay. And the, the Antichrist is going to make that the norm, the changing of the law, the changing of the times. And then it says this, and they shall be given into his hand, verse number 25, until a time and times and the dividing of time. But the judgment shall sit, uh, and they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it unto the end. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Hitherto is the end of the matter. As for me, Dano, my cogitations must trouble me, and my countenance changed in me, but I kept the matter in my heart. And so Dano uh, is revealed this, what is going to happen in the future. We see here the time, times and a half dividing of time, the three and a half years of tribulation, the tribulation divided into two separate uh, times we know that three and a half years there will be peace. God will be judging the years, but 
earth, but there will be political peace. We know that the rising of the, the Antichrist uh, will lead to, he will broker that peace uh, politically on this earth. Uh, and then three and a half years of the tribulation, that peace is broken. We see the persecution. We see all of that happening. Jesus then comes back, sets up his kingdom upon this earth. And we see here uh, that in verse number 27, the kingdom, the dominion, the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Uh, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Uh, and so what, what do we have to learn from this? We, we kind of see this timeline uh, through this vision of Daniel, of the tribulation, the, the Antichrist rise to power, uh, and we note the millennial reign to follow that. Uh, and let me just encourage you, even as we heard last night, we need to be eternally minded, uh, eternity minded. Uh, we, we get so caught up in the temporal we get so caught up in this life, we're going to miss what God is doing in the future, what God is doing in eternity. Uh, so let's lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt. And let's seek to live for our Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, I'm not saying we shirk out on our responsibilities. I'm not saying we're not to be good stewards of what God has blessed us with. That is, that is far from the truth. But I will say this, uh, being responsible, being a good steward with things that are spiritual as well. What are we stewarding? What do we have the responsibility of? The word of God, the gospel. We've been blessed to know it. We need to go out and teach it and preach it. Uh, and we need to be serving Jesus. Hey, we'll be serving him in eternity. You know, we ought to serve him today uh, and, and laying up for ourselves treasures in eternity. All right. Uh, thank you so much for being on today. I know we went a little bit longer than we typically do, uh, but thank you so much for being on today. Let's welcome and greet those that have commented live. Uh, and uh, thank you once again for, for watching. Hit that share button if you haven't already done so. Brian and Cindy, good morning to you both. Have a great day, both of you. Dennis and Geraldine, good morning to you both. Hope you guys have an awesome day. Cliff and Karen, good morning to you as well. And David and Claudia, good morning to you both. Have a great day. All right, I want to encourage you, uh, be in our service tonight, 6 o'clock, final service of our Faith, Family, and Culture Conference. It will also be live streamed as well and would encourage you to be on. Lord bless you all. Have a great day, everybody. Don't forget service at 6 o'clock tonight.